हरि ओम ओम हरि ओम ओम हरि ओम ओम सहना सहनौ भुनक्त सह वीर्यं करवाजस्वीना अदितमस्तु मिदिशवाय शांति 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 ओम मे द डिवाइन बीइंग लुक ओवर अस लविंगली एज अ मदर एंड फादर मे द डिवाइन बीइंग सपोर्ट एंड नरिश अस एज अ मदर एंड फादर मे वी हैव द स्ट्रेंथ एंड स्किल टू स्टडी टुगेदर the art of spirituality may no misunderstandings arise amongst us om peace 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 be unto thee and to us and to all your beloved children everywhere so welcome everyone to our noon class on saturday the uh, yoga sutras were finished the how to know god book and so today we take up the book divine grace now this is one of my favorite books of all of the books published by the ramakrishna order it's a very short book 83 pages as we'll hear it was not intended as a book in the beginning uh jeff will read the introduction and tell us how this came to be but before we begin uh with the divine grace book is there anything else that anyone would like to comment on uh have a concern about or ask a question about from last uh the last sessions on the sutras or anything else of any concern to you all right dears so uh jeff if you will just begin with the very first page of divine grace and uh, read into it first we'll learn how the book came to be uh so i start with the preface it's about half a page, half a page worth of text Uh, the preface, which is uh, just signed by the publisher, Swami Ranganathananda. I may I may need some lessons on how to say that. Swami Ranganathananda, you did fine. Ranganathananda, who has been for the last few years meeting cultured and earnest audiences in many parts of the world, and sharing with them the inspiring Vedantic ideas. especially as taught and lived by Sri Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda was invited in 1978 to address the members of the Beacon Yoga Center Shivananda Ashrama Perth Western Australia on the 20th of June of that year he gave a discourse on divine grace which was keenly appreciated as god's grace is one of the seminal concepts in many a major religion and as an understanding of the nature and the working of grace can provide solutions to most of the tension generating problems of today we thought it advantageous to publish the lecture in book form so that its message may reach a wider audience than the limited circle that could hear the swami in person we are thankful to swami kirtananda right did i say that right Kir- yes kirtidananda Secretary Sri Ramakrishna Mission Students Home Mialapur I didn't say that right Mailapur for finding time in the midst of his heavy official duties to prepare an informative index to the book as a labor of love signed publisher Sri Ramakrishna Mat Madras of course which is now Chennai and that concludes the preface okay i'm sure there is is there anything to add to that it just uh it's self explanatory this is how this wonderful little book came to be 
So with that, please begin reading Swami Ranganathananda's discourse now published as this book, Divine Grace. Please go ahead, Jeff. Are you there? We may have lost Jeff. It looks like he might be frozen. His screen looks, it, yeah, it is. It's frozen, so he's probably having a bandwidth issue. Well, does anyone else have the book that they can begin reading? Yeah, uh, I can begin reading. I, mean, uh, I have it in Kindle form, so I, I can read it from my screen. Please do. Okay. We'll hope we get Jeff back yeah. uh, in, in due course. Yeah. So, Divine Grace by Swami Ranganathananda. One introduction. This evening, I shall speak to you on Divine Grace, which is such a great theme in Christianity, Hinduism, and Islam and one school of Mahayana Buddhism, divine grace is taught in all these religions as the ultimate of spiritual development and fulfillment. In the New Testament, you find this statement in John 1 of 17, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. Quotes finished. Was that word uh, grace and what came from Jesus Christ? Uh, grace and truth, truth. came by. Truth. Thank yeah, you. Truth came by Jesus Christ. That is a beautiful idea. We want grace and love and we want law also. Both these aspects are comprehended in the philosophy of yoga of the Bhagavad Gita. The following book expounds a complete philosophy of life. And the more we understand it, the more we get an insight into and grip on this complex phenomenon called human life. I'll stop now, at that. Please anyway. read that again. This is his statement of purpose of the book. What is it that he's trying to offer us? So please read that again. Just those last few sentences that state the purpose of the book. The great book expounds a complete philosophy of life. And the more we understand it, the more we get an insight into and grip on this complex phenomenon called human life. Should I read from the beginning of the paragraph again? No, no, that's fine. That's fine. We get it. We get, we get a grasp on this complex phenomenon, human life. The purpose of this book is to offer us a comprehensive understanding of what it means to be human. Because to be human is to live the act and fact of grace. This is the reason we exist. And as we'll see, I won't uh, elaborate on that because the Swami does a much better job. Anything else from anyone before we move on? I just want to comment on the entire topic of the book, Divine Grace. Yes. I mean, as we even read Patanjali's Yoga Sutra or other places, always there is a place where it seems like your efforts come to a point where you to get to the next level, you need divine grace, which seems like it's a fill in the blank, and maybe this book will fill that blank up. Yes, and... Uh... You're absolutely right. The fact is, according to the deepest scriptures, 
that everything that exists is a phenomenon produced by divine grace, or another way of saying it is of divine love. As uh, Jesus Christ said to Julian of Norwich, the universe is made of love. The universe is intended to manifest love and it is meant to fill your heart. So we can just replace the word love with grace and uh, come to the same uh, place. Everything is the result of the grace of the divine in doing this at all. Anything else from anyone before? Uh, I just have a general comment on Swami Ranganathananda. Uh, in 20 or, or maybe four or five decades ago, uh, Swami Ranganathananda would appear either at a university like IIT or he would appear at a, uh, a major con conglomerate like Tata's and he would give a lecture and mm -hmm. that lecture would be so good that it would get compiled on that topic and similar to this topic that it got compiled. So it's very similarity that he typically doesn't write books, but gives lectures would get later on compiled as books. Yes, well, that that's very true. And Swami Ranganathananda uh, became one of the presidents of the Ramakrishna order. As a matter of fact, he was president uh, in 1999, when with a group of other young men, <coughs> I was fortunate enough to visit Belramat and actually be in his presence uh, during his presidency. We asked for an audience with him and uh, his uh, attendants said, all right, you may have 10 minutes. We were with him and 45 minutes after we came in to the room with him, uh, he was still talking with us and offering us the fruits of his great wisdom and grace and waving away his attendants when they came to remind him that he should move on. So this was a great man indeed and so loving and so attentive uh, to, the, to the needs of those people who came into his presence. He gave spiritual instruction to one of us that had not had any spiritual instruction from a guru. And uh, to another, he gave a spiritual name. Uh, out of the five of us who were there, two of us received his very deliberate personal attention. It was glorious. And uh, you can imagine the radiance that filled that room. It was, it was, uh, you can see it left a deep mark on my heart. And uh, so this is the Swami Ranganathananda. I had seen him a couple of times before when he came to give talks, as you mentioned, and these he came to give at the <coughs> Vedanta Society of Southern California in, uh, in Hollywood. This was years earlier, a couple of decades earlier, I think. In any event, he was long lived and uh, quite, uh, I mean, he was such a remarkable personality. Anything else from anyone before Bhaskar reads on? I hope uh, brother, can you hear me? Yes, uh, so um, getting a spiritual name uh, is is it like uh, how does it happen and is it just uh, the inspiration that uh, uh, Swamiji's and gurus receive that they give it to somebody or is there like some process? No, there's no process. Uh, the, the the Swami does it either at his own initiative when you receive initiation, or you may do it at some other time. Um, 
So it, uh, it's just strictly out of his uh, or her, uh, rarely, but uh, her own uh, spiritual initiation, a uh, spiritual uh, intuition uh, that, uh, that, that, that this happens. But you can ask for a spiritual thing and you can ask for it apart from being initiated but the decision is strictly up to the guru, the, the, uh, the monk or nun who you're asking. Uh, <clears throat> I knew a nun who gave uh, spiritual names in Hollywood. Um, she was quite a remarkable woman. Thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. Anything else from anyone? I just want to make one remark. I think uh, we shouldn't be comparing Swamiji's, but I couldn't help doing this, is that in today's date, when you look, go to many, uh, many Ramakrishna uh, Mat uh, Swamiji's have beautiful YouTube videos. And I yes. think the well known of that is Swami Sarupya Nanda, and he's very, very popular. Yes. And three or four decades ago, we didn't have YouTube. And you had to really go for lectures. And I would compare that Swami Ranganathan that had that kind of grip as we have, <laughs> Sarvapriya has, Nanda has over the medium of YouTube. Yes, uh, Swami Ranganathan Nanda and Sarvapriya Nanda are in many ways comparable. You're right. It was said of Swami Ranganathan Nanda that of those who had known both men, uh, Swami Vivekananda and Ranganathan Nanda, and Ranganathananda was the most like Swami Vivekananda of any of the Ramakrishna order Swamis. And this was widely recognized and widely spoken of. Quite a comparison to make. Huh? So thank you, Ashkar. The so last historical anecdote I'll bring forward, and I'm not sure if I'm uh, accurate on this. The Ganges uh, resort or um, ashram in the banks of, I think, uh, Lake Michigan in the eastern part where uh, uh, Ramakrishna Mission, probably in the 1960s and 70s, was trying to uh, open a brahmacharya and monk order training a place monastery and that's still there yes it is and and, and it functions well, it is initiative right uh, say it again was it swami ranganathan and this initiative to have this ganges opened no it was not his it was the the uh, it was swami bashananda who was the head of the chicago uh i think probably because of the timing there was probably some concurrence from Ranganathananda, but it was Swami Bhashananda who opened the Ganges Center. And it functioned as a training center for some time. Swami Yogeshananda, the founder of this uh, center, was one of those trained there by Swami Bhashananda. It was quite a remarkable place, that yes. the Chicago Center. That, that's this is Jen. That's um, where I come from. Is um, Michigan, and Swami Bhashananda um, was the the Swami there um, all those years until he passed in the nineties. Yes. Um, and Swami Yogeshananda that um, ran the bookstore at the Ganges retreat all yes. those years ago. Yes. Yes, and it's one of the reasons that he started such a successful bookstore here at the Vedanta Center of Atlanta. He, along with Jillian Renault, started a, this wonderful little bookshop that we have at the center, which still fulfills the needs of many people who have ready access to, to uh, a wide range of, of uh, spiritual texts. So thank you for bringing that up, Jim. That's nice. And Bhashananda was a remarkable and very powerful Swami. Uh, he ended up losing his ability to speak, but he initiated people even after 
he uh, lost his ability to speak. Okay. I was, I was going to say, that, you know, when I when I read the third story in the Chandi, and you know, it matched my experience and I related to it. But recently, I've run across a person who seemed to have genuinely be seeking, you know, or trying to work on the path. But I guess just like in the eight limbs of yoga. They got to a point and and the the grace didn't come for them, or at least they don't think so. And now they're very um, I guess you could say angry or uh towards the divine. And I was just curious because in I had just assumed that it happens for everyone. And the the anger will be there until they learn the lesson of being angry. And then that too will pass and they'll move on. But it all happens according to Sri Ramakrishna at exactly the right time. So there's a lesson for this person to be, for them to learn from their experience of being angry. But one of the things that they'll find is how futile it is. It really yields nothing for them or for anyone else. And uh, but this is they, they'll learn this in in their own due time. We each and every one of us has lessons to learn. Anger, doubt, fear, greed, all of these things are they arise because they're part of the phenomenal world that we inhabit. That is part of our waking awareness. And for that matter, our dream sleep. So nothing too much to concern ourselves about. Uh, as uh, Swami Brahmananda once remarked when he was walking in the streets of Kolkata uh, with another devotee, and they saw one of the one of Brahmananda's uh, disciples literally drunk in the gutter literally drunk lying in the gutter. And the disciple walking with Brahmananda began to be judgmental about this person. And the Swami interrupted him and said, no, no, don't concern yourself. He's just backsliding a little. So um, it seems to us that we take two steps forward and one step back. We're told by the Swamis, it isn't really true. There is no step back. We're just learning from the two steps forward. But it sometimes seems that uh, we lose our ability to do what we had been able to do. But that is part of the lesson, not a step backward. We take no steps backward. Having gone forward, we're just always that far forward. But there's things to be learned in, in those uh, moments of being that far forward. Anything else from anyone about that or anything else? <clears throat> All right, dear Bhaskar, please read on. I hope we haven't lost Jeff. I, I I can't see well enough to see whether he's returned or not. Now, I'm here, brother. Um, my internet connection seems to be intermittent. I was noticing that earlier this morning, so I think it's it's good that uh, Bashkar has stepped up to do this, and uh, well, I'm, I I, I'm enjoying um, his voice, and for some reason his pronunciation is much better than mine. Well, of course, he speaks the language. <laughs> uh, as uh, his his pronunciation would be better than any of ours, unless uh, uh, Sanskrit or Bengali or or, was, uh, or Hindi was our native tongue. So please read on, Bhaskar. We do not start our life 
with an awareness of God, but only with an awareness of the external world. Awareness of Would God. Would you start that again, please? This is we, such a key point. Where we start life. We do not start our life with an awareness of God, but only with an awareness of the external world. <clears throat> awareness of God comes later. The Bhagavad Gita seeks to convey to us a philosophy which will be relevant to all those who are handling the world of men and things and are being handled by it and to those others who have developed an awareness of God and responded to his love. What are usually called the secular aspect and the spiritual aspect of life, both are comprehended in the philosophy of the Gita, which means that this philosophy is meant for all people. Let's underline that. This philosophy that is represented by the Gita and therefore by extrapolation this book is meant for all people. <clears throat> whether they receive it or not, whether they seek it or not, that is a matter of time. Uh, they will all, in one way or another, according to Sri Ramakrishna, we will all seek this at some time or another. What we find in the way of scriptural and other aids, uh, and what we encounter in the way of teachers is unique to us, each one of us. There will be things in common, but it will be unique. So this is so important for us to know. This awareness of God will come to us. So would you read that again from the beginning, please? Yes. We do not start our life with an awareness of God, but only with an awareness of the external world. Awareness of God comes later. The Bhagavad Gita seeks to convey to us a philosophy which will be relevant to all those who are handling the world of men and things and are being handled by it, and to those others who have developed an awareness of God and responded to his love. What are usually called the secular aspects and the spiritual aspects of life, both are comprehended in the philosophy of the Gita, which means that this philosophy is meant for all people. Extremely condensed, probably needs quite a bit of unpacking in our minds. <clears throat> well, yes, this book is extremely condensed. And uh, it's meant to be. This business of there not being a secular and a spiritual aspect to life. It is all the divine unfolding its grace and love. So it may seem secular, your job, your home responsibilities, they may seem separate. But if you look at them in the, in the terms that the Gita says, look at them with the eye of worshipfulness, that when you are serving uh, at work or your, your family, it is the divine being that you are serving. When you uh, do anything, when you think of anything, when anything arises within you, if you offer it, if you offer it, which is preached to us, and I believe chapter six of the Gita, you do it sacramentally. What does sacramentally mean? Sacrament, a sacrament is the outward manifestation of an inward grace. That is the technical definition of sacrament. So when we offer our lives, our actions, our thoughts, 
everything that we are, can be, and do, when we offer it sacramentally, then and when we think of our actions in the world as being in some way worship of the divine being, there is no such thing as secular or spiritual. It is, as the Swami said, comprehensive. Any comments, concerns, or questions about any of that? This is such a key idea that we should really have it firmly in our grasp before we move on. That yeah. last few words that you said, this philosophy is meant for all people, it almost, and made us underline, it almost gives me the feel that we should call Bhagavad Gita as the common man's philosophy because Often people who are educated has this ego developing themselves that I'm very well learned and I have at my fingertips the Gita, the uh, Patanjali Yoga Sutra or whatever else. But here it's clearly reminding everybody to know Gita is common man's philosophy. It's for everyone to use, read and learn and practice. <clears throat> yes, and grasp as they can. If you read the Gita more than once, and that's highly recommended. As you read the Gita a second, third, fourth, fifth time, you'll find that there's more in the Gita than you knew before. Why? Because you have changed. It isn't that the Gita, the words of the Gita have changed. No, you have changed. And so you're able to receive more than you were able to receive before. <clears throat> and this continues to be true from here. This continues to be true no matter how many times you read the Gita, because those 700 verses are, as the Swami said, comprehensive, a comprehensive grasp and way of relating to life. That, that doesn't leave anything out. How glorious is that? Anything else from anyone? All right, dear, please read on. This one had a footnote saying, based on a discourse given at the Beacon Yoga Center, Sivananda Ashram, Perth, Western Australia on June 20, 1978. So probably Ranganathan they were in the decades of 70s, 80s, and 90s, I'm guessing. Yes, well, that's that's just a, a quote from the preface that we read earlier. Uh, that uh, this just reemphasizes uh, where this came from and how it came to be. So section two, uh, the heading is three stages of spiritual life. So from this point of view, the hundreds of verses uh, of the Gita can be, I'm just going to, I'm just trying to move uh, things in my, can be uh, divided into paths. First, we have an awareness of an external social environment of man around us, posing a challenge as to how to handle it for one's own growth and for its own welfare. Up to this point, it is all purushakara or self-reliance and self-effort. And its second the second reliance on fellow human beings and on cooperation with them. Now we seem to have lost you, dear. No, I'm there. Oh, okay. I'm there. <laughs> what, what is it that, so read what you just- I just finished the uh, first paragraph, but I can read it again. Please do. So from this point of view, the 700 verses of Gita can be, uh, there's one word that I can read, divided into two parts. 
first, we have an awareness of an external social environment of man around us, posing a challenge as to how to handle it for one's own growth and for its own welfare. Up to this point, it is all purushakara or self-reliance and self-effort, and a second reliance on fellow human beings and on cooperation with them. This business of self-reliance and self-effort, as Swami Vivekananda says, this is the basic message of the Gita, that we are to be strong, self-reliant, and put forth our efforts to master. Hmm? The master what? Master nature, that is to say, the phenomenal world, both external and internal. So the various efforts, self-efforts, are prescribed by the Gita for doing both those things. And as I say, the more you read the Gita, the more profound the teachings become. Anything else from anyone? So is Purushakara uh, a concept that is introduced in Gita, used very much in Gita? I'm probably a little ignorant about it. Well, Pur Purushakara uh, comes from Sankhya philosophy. Purusha being that which uh, gives the energy to produce Mahat, the great cause. From Mahat comes the buddhi and the intellect or the intelligence to understand. So the buddhi is able to distinguish one thing from another. The intellect or cosmic ego sense says, aha, it is this cosmic eye that is uh, distinguishing one thing from another. This is the precursor to Purushakara, because at this point then, the, the uh, divine being as buddhi, as mahat buddhi, an ego sense, the cosmic ego sense, goes on to create the other 21 uh, cosmic principles. There are 24 uh, mahat uh, buddhi, ego sense or, or intellect. And then they, these go on to create these others and invite us to participate in them so that we learn our way back out of this maze. We retrace our steps back up the ladder to the great, the, the great cause the, and Mahat. Thank you, dear. Thanks for bringing me lunch. So I, I'm still a little foggy about the word Purushakara. I understand the cosmology of Sankhya philosophy where we start with the Purush and the unmanifested Prakriti to the manifested Prakriti to the Mahat to the Buddhi, the Ahamkara, Chitta, and then the 20 Tattvas that we have. Mm -hmm. And doing it in reverse gets you the meditation part, which is pretty much what uh, uh, Swami Prabhupada had in his uh, detailed discussion on, I remember the Sutra number 17 that we did in our mm -hmm. past session. So what is Purushakara then? I understand that Purush and I understand these 24 tattvas. What is the concept that Purushakara then relates to it? It is that grace that is given to us to want to push forward. Uh, so within, we're able with the power of that grace and that motivation to actually do things because we're not going to make any progress. Well, we'll make very slow progress, but uh, if we're going to make more ro rapid progress, we have to do things. We have to slowly and slowly uh, eliminate our attachment 
to the phenomenal world, to the body, mind, intellect, and senses. <clears throat> and cleave to or attach ourselves to the Atman, the, the witness self. And so this is, this is a process. This is, for most people, this does not happen quickly. For most people, it is a, a, there is a great deal of self-effort involved. And it is effort, and it is, it is work, and it is struggle. So this is Purushakar, the, the soul pushing forward. Purusha, the soul or Atman. Kara, Kara is rooted in the word <coughs> to act. And so, uh, you are acting as that uh, soul being. As Swami Vivekananda said, each soul is potentially divine. <clears throat> potentially doesn't mean maybe or maybe not. It means that there is the potential there. It simply is to be manifest. So the each soul is potentially divine. The goal of human life is to manifest this divinity by controlling nature, both external and internal. Do this by work or worship or psychic control or philosophy, one or more of all these and be free. All else is secondary details. That summary statement is a definition of Purushakar. That the soul, having received this instruction, moves forward, sometimes rarely on its own, most often in the company of others, holy company, and by the grace of the third uh, of the human races, uh, with the instruction of a qualified teacher. The three graces, as we're told, the first is human birth. The second is this desire for liberation, this desire to practice some sort of way of freeing ourselves. And the third is the teacher, the uh, qualified teacher who tells us how to go about it. One of these, of course, is Krishna. You may encounter uh, in your lifetime either an embodied or disembodied uh, personal teacher that gives you instructions, perhaps a mantra but certainly instructions. Is all that clear? Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. We move to the next paragraph. Next comes an awareness of something that transcends this sensory world <clears throat> and sensory man in a hazy consciousness of the spiritual dimension of human life and intimation of immortality, as poet Wordsworth put it, has set in, but we are all still far away from a true spiritual commitment and from a genuine dedication to the divine. We are beginners we seek to enter the spiritual life. We strive and struggle to capture God awareness. We want to feel stronger and stronger spirituality, spiritually. Up to this point, it is still self-reliance and self-effort primarily, but gently getting suffused <clears throat> with a faith in the divine. 
So please read that all over from the beginning. Each one of these paragraphs is such, as you said, it is very condensed, very compact. So let's see if there's anything as we move through it that needs any clarification or amplification. Next comes an awareness of something that transcends the sensory world and sensory man in a hazy consciousness of the spiritual dimensions of human life. And in quotes, imitation of Im immortality, 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 imitation of immortality, a poet, as poet Wordsworth put it, has set in, but we are still far away from a true spiritual commitment and from a genuine dedication to the divine. We are beginners. We seek to enter the spiritual life. We strive and struggle to capture God awareness. We want to feel stronger and stronger spiritually. Up to this point, it is still self-reliance and self-effort primarily, but gently getting suffused with a faith in the divine. How beautifully put. Any, anything, anything from anyone? Or a comment from your own experience? Or a concern or a question? I just have to say guilty is charged on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if you feel guilty. Uh, but uh, there's no reason to feel guilty. It is well, a perfectly natural thing. Well, I'm saying guilty in the sense that we, I always have a tendency to overestimate myself and my spiritual progress and not realize I am the beginner that has this imitation or of immortality. As you intimation. Know. Intimation. Intimation. In, well, hints and allegations. Mm -hmm. That's what intimation means. A hint or an allegation. <clears throat> and that is a wonderful poem by Wordsworth, by the way. Uh, Intimations of Immortality. You can find it online. It's through Wordsworth was really quite, he quite lived his name. Uh, he was really a, an outstanding poet and spiritual philosopher. So intimations of immortality. Thank you, Bhagavan does. Well, too, I mean, the struggle where we're running on self-will trying to do this struggle, too. Well, this is that second grace, that that yearning uh, in Sanskrit, mumukshatra, this yearning now that there's some sense of this divine aspect to life, we're no longer confined <clears throat> to the world. We have, something has opened up for us. Because, you know, because so you, know, you keep catching, or at least I keep catching <clears throat> myself putting my hands on the steering wheel and trying to be the doer. Mm hmm and and it's just um, uh, it just it, uh, it's just our default mode, and it's just um, you know it, it's pernicious. <laughs> well, it's pernicious, but it's completely predictable, as has been said here many times. We're eons old, eons old. We have evolved over that period of time. And it is an evolution. We have involved, evolved ways of coping with being embodied. And there's nothing whatsoever wrong with that. It's absolutely necessary. So 
we just have to slowly and slowly unlearn those as our primary way of being. It doesn't mean that our coping mechanisms aren't appropriate. Most of them are really quite appropriate. Otherwise, they wouldn't have persisted. But that becomes the first level. Then there's a second and third level that is built on top of that, which is what this Swami is in the process of talking about. He's talked about the first level. Now he's talked about the second level. And he's about to tell us about the third level when, as he says, our awareness becomes suffused. Suffused, what a wonderful, beautiful, provocative word. Suffused with a divine awareness. Anything else from anyone? Pretty much echoing what you said in the first paragraph, he says there are two things. The first one is the awareness or Purushakara. The second is the reliance on the fellow human beings. And like you said, on the end of second paragraph, he, on the very last phrase says, suffused with divine faith. So he's just about introducing the third thing. Exactly. Divine faith. So if you just summarize those two paragraphs. Very good. Read on if there's nothing else from anyone. We're coming to the end of our time. Mm -hmm. uh, let me be mindful of what it is. We have another one. Point. Oh, yeah, that's good. Okay, please read. We we'll have on. nine minutes. Yeah. From now on, life becomes a partnership between man and God. And spiritual progress registers the progress of God becoming the major partner in the human life process. Okay, let me just stop right there and say this is the sequence according to Swami Sri Dharananda, of exactly what was just described. But he puts it in this lovely, very memorable form. And you know, what we're being told here is uh, discursive and so hard to remember. But this that the Swami said is incisive and very easy to remember. We start off with this sense of I am. Of course we have that feeling. It's perfectly natural, how can we deny it? Here I am, I am. But then there's this intimation of immortality, these hints and allegations. And so somehow there becomes both I and thou. We see that there is a thou that is the creator and the one who has produced all of this, that we are a part of and however we are a part of it. So now there's I and thou. At some point, he says, because of our spiritual practices and because of our growing awareness of truth with a capital T, we see Thou art, the thou becomes first, thou art, therefore I am. This can be defined as Savikalpa Samadhi. You see that the reason you exist is because the divine presence exists and you are inextricably <coughs> and irretrievably a part of that. There's no way backward now. You see in this experience, and it is an experience, uh, of the divine presence being all that is. Everything else is peripheral, secondary, and somehow, if you visualize it, as a pie, you are a slice out of that pie. Okay. 
We lost you, Brother Shankara. Are other people still there? Yeah, I think yes. uh, we lost Brother Shankara. Looks like some people. Yes, we did. Up. Um. There's still. We're probably almost at the top of the hour, so yeah. four more minutes we can wait. This, this is such an interesting paragraph or page to me because it's like the struggle between self-will and effort and the struggle between not being the doer. Yeah, it reminds me of this book, uh, Tipping Point. But when you use the tipping point an analogy in a lot of these spiritual disciplines that we are talking about, whether it's Yoga Sutra or Bhagavad Gita, somebody we come to a tipping point, but then we need the divine grace to pull us over the tipping point. And so I'm very glad that uh, this book was chosen because I was wanting to see that I needed to understand divine grace as you come to a tipping point and then you would need the divine grace to pu pull you through the next step. Pretty much similar to the other observation you made, Bhagavan Das, uh, a little while ago about one of your friends who probably came to a tipping point but just got angry because he wasn't going over the tipping point. Well, you know, the statement in the earlier page stood out to me where it said that um, basically it said that um, uh, to those others who have developed an awareness of God and respond to his love which implies that there are others who did not respond to his love and that's what i was thinking about in the case of this person mm -hmm. so i know this book was covered uh, on a uh, wednesday evening uh, and I couldn't get there. <laughs> I got there a couple of times, so uh, yeah. I was very anxious and uh, without even influencing brother, it just, just showed up <laughs> as we changed. It is an incredibly dense book. It's not something that you could just hear at a talk and get it, and at least not for me, and be like, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's something I even having it imprint in my face after read each paragraph over and over. Well, I guess uh, that's the style of Swami Ranganathan. Uh, he expects you to have a certain foundation. So when he's speaking, he's expecting that. And that's why he's able to be so dense. And then you have to unpack it. If you well, if you don't have that foundation, you'll have to unpack it. It's really. Well, also, this is a transcription of the Swami's talk. And so we're at the liberty of the transcriber. And that's why things might be a little densely packed also. Agreed. Uh, we're almost at the top of the hour. Should we just conclude and say that we'll join next time? I think that's a good idea. Ashkar, thank you for reading today. You helped me out of the jam. <laughs> well, I'm uh, sure, you know, we should uh, swing around and <laughs> And sometimes you read and you stay awake. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. Being highly dyslexic, some of these Swami's names is just brutal on me. I'm just like, <laughs> you know what? Uh, and I was almost like this, uh, even though I was born in India and I lived my life in India and then I lived here. 
And I heard all these names, but I never cared to really understand them. Right. It's only in the last two, three years that I'm actually going and listening to this YouTube and brother and a couple of other webinars that I've stopped to think and say, what does that word mean? I I might have heard it all along in the tea shops and the streets of Calcutta, but I never stopped to think. So again, what I'm trying to say is, Bhagavan Das, my experience is not too much different than yours. You were here, but you're starting to recognize them. I was there. I did not recognize them. Now I'm making an effort to recognize them. So again, we were probably in the same boat. I think we're closing up now, guys. I have to go, so I'm going to chant. Namaste. Jai Sri Guru Maharaj Ji Ki Jai Durga Durga Durga. Hmm. See you guys. Thank you.